Hey, it's Talknosis, and uh, I always talk about how excited we are about our guests, and I don't want people to think that I'm untruthful. We just booked uh, the best of the best. But uh, somebody who I was saying that, it, that it's basically embarrassing that we haven't tried to have him on the show before, but we have Dr. David Brackey. Hello, Dr. Brackey. Hi, great to be here. Yeah, really, really uh, pumped to talk to you, especially about the, the topic, which is going to be the Gospel of Judas, something we've never discussed on the show before, something that you have a new translation in a, in a, a new book out about so uh I, I think both us and the audience is, is going to be very excited to to delve into this this very interesting topic mm -hmm. uh before we do however a uh, quick commercial quick plug for our patreon uh we can't do the show without your financial support help us out for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you can actually put a cap on that and just make it a buck i think a buck is the lowest patreon allows uh and uh, we actually do uh, i'm gonna reveal a secret going to unveil a, a, a deep dark gnostic secret which is uh we do hope to start another show uh jason and i have been talking about doing one that's just only about uh pop culture and uh gnostic -y content and artists influenced by gnosticism and by the ancient gnostics so we are hoping to start that second show so you can help make that a reality by helping us out of patreon you can also do paypal.me slash gnostic for one-time donations and also you can help us out you know i know that these are interesting times tough times you can help us out in other ways that aren't financial by liking subscribing telling people about the show sharing it on social media all that good stuff okay dr racky we're we're through we're through the commercial portion time to to, to jump in here and, and i know that this is this is a, a big topic something we could do a whole show about but just to be to sort of set the grounds, to be a little bit more specific. You know, I were to use the term Gnosticism. It, it in and of itself is, is a controversial term. But I, I was wondering if you can tell us about, you know, you, a quick overview, an elevator speech style of, of what you mean when you say the Gnostics or, or quote-unquote Gnostic Christians. Uh, sure. I, I use the term, both these terms interchangeably, to refer to... Christians that are, that were active in the second and third centuries that are identified by two men, in particular Irenaeus of Lyon and Porphyry of Tyre, as Gnostics. They call them the Gnostics or the Gnostic school of thought, uh, and uh, and they identify some of the works of literature that came from these people, including the Gospel of Judas. Uh, and uh, other scholars often refer to these particular folks as Sethians, if they like, you know, some people do use the term Gnosticism in a kind of bigger way to include lots of different groups, which is fine. And then they usually call this group the Sethians um, to distinguish them from other people like the Valentinians and stuff like that. So if you're familiar with the world of Gnostic studies, then just think Sethian when I use it, but that's who I'm talking about. Okay, perfect, perfect. So what is the Gospel of Judas? And, you know, I, I know that that is, again, a big question. But if you can tell us a little bit about when it is from, and, and why did we only start hearing about it in the last decade or so? Because a book of title, I got to say, that that's quite the hook. You, you know, why? How, how come how come we haven't been hearing about this one for thousands of years? <laughs> well, you should have been, because um, we uh, scholars long knew that there was or had been a Gospel of Judas because Irenaeus in the year 180 mentions it as as being promoted by the Gnostics. Um, however, and people were like, wow, there was a Gospel of Judas. Too bad we don't have it anymore. And some, however, were a little skeptical that there would be such a book and thought maybe the Judas of the Gospel of Judas that, that Irenaeus mentioned is really the Judas who wrote the epistle of Jude, you know, the, in the New Testament, there's a Jude, which really is Judas also, but we say Jude to distinguish that person from the Judas Iscariot person. And so people thought, well, maybe that's the one they're talking, you know, whatever. In any event, uh, we didn't have it. And so people didn't talk about it that much. However, um, in circumstances that we really aren't quite sure about, uh, a Coptic codex, that is a ancient book written in Coptic, was discovered in the late 20th century in Egypt, which contains a Coptic text with the title The Gospel of Judas. Um, due to very unfortunate circumstances, it did not become known to the scholarly world 
until 2006. So, um, so that's why it was only recently recovered and rediscovered in Coptic. Um, you know, probably about 40 years ago and only became available to scholars. Well, now, what is it? 16 years ago, I guess. So that's why you haven't heard that much about it until recent years, but it is a big deal. Yeah. So uh, why a new translation? Uh, didn't you already uh, release a, a translation that you've done? And isn't there other translations out there by, by other scholars already? Plenty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, uh, the simple answer to your question is this book is in a series called the Anchor Yale Bible. It is, which is a venerable series of biblical commentaries. And this is the, actually the first book in that series that is not about a text considered canonical by any Christians. Hmm. So it's kind of a big deal. Um, and all the volumes are called whatever a new translation with introduction. <laughs> so part of the answer is, is that that's just the title that the series gives to every single book in the series. But uh, nonetheless, yes, the, the translation in here is new. I mean, you know, it's been around 16 years. So people, there is no, uh, to use the word canonical in a different way, there's no canonical translation. That is, people are still arguing about how to translate things, which of course we still do about texts we've known for centuries, right? Um, but this one, yeah, it's got some obscurities to it. And um, and yeah, I've changed my, you know, I have a translation I published in the second edition of the Gnostic Scriptures by Bentley Layton. But, you know, in the time period between doing that one and doing this, I changed my mind about some stuff and, uh, and was also freer to be a little uh, more daring because uh, this new book, The Gospel of Judas, allows me to explain my choices, right? I can say, I've chosen to translate this way, but it would be perfectly good to do this. While the Gnostic scriptures, that format of that book doesn't allow that. So I was much more conservative and didn't take many risks. But yes, there are plenty of translations. They do differ in some important ways. So uh, people who are really into the Gospel of Judas or Gnosticism should be, you should look at different ones to see what they have and uh even perhaps by the, the standards of, of, of some of these texts it, it is pretty fragmentary right like there are some some stuff that that you have to reconstruct or some terms that you have to guess at or some halves of words is, is that right it's full of holes yes yeah. it's a it's a very fragmentary the codex doesn't survive completely like the entire pages right are gone uh, so we don't know exactly how many pages the book originally had. Um, but then the pages that survive are both very fragmentary, lots of holes, um, also very difficult to read in places. The ink is faded uh, or has um, flaked off. You know, sometimes it kind of just flakes off the page. Um, uh, some of this is just the natural result of being you know, whatever it would be, and what is it, 1600 years old, potentially. Uh, but uh, a lot of it is due to mistreatment that it received after its discovery, including uh, be sitting in a safe deposit box in a bank on Long Island for a long time with no, you know, conditions to keep it healthy. And then I regret to say that someone thought the best way to conserve it would be to put it in a freezer. And that was a very bad idea because it's it's made of papyrus. So this is organic material. So if you freeze it, just like when you freeze lunch meat, right, that you get at the store, if you freeze it and then thaw it, all the, a lot of the liquid comes out. And that's what happened to this. So anyway, it's bad. It's bad. <laughs> it's the thing to say. So yes, there are many places where we don't know exactly what it says. And so much of uh, a book like mine is devoted, I'm afraid, to things like, well, it could be this, or it could be that, or it could be this, or it could be that, that kind of thing. Right. Now, uh, uh, forgive the, the following rant, but uh, I really like the, the great modernist writer Morley Callahan, so I'm shoehorning <laughs> him in because I, I think he, he's not really that well known nowadays. But, but that said, he was a contemporary of Hemingway's, and later on he wrote an excellent novel called A Time for Judas, ah. where, where, 
the, the plot line for this is, is Judas is secretly a hero who secretly puts together a plan with Jesus to betray him. Jesus is in on it. And then he helps him survive on the cross. And then he resurrects him with primitive medical help. And it's all to start a new religion. And some people have said that this this, this fictional plot that, that Morley Callahan wrote uh, well before the discovery of the Gospel of Judas, the rediscovery of the Gospel of Judas, uh, have said that this is basically the plot of the Gospel of Judas. Is, is, is it something like this? Is, is Judas a hero in this Gospel of Judas book? I wouldn't say that he's a hero because um, he because the, the Gospel unequivocally says that killing Jesus, or more precisely, the human person that Jesus is in or whatever, is a bad thing. It's an evil act. It's, it's not a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the gospel, so, so, it's, so it's not heroic in that sense, right? Um, but on the other hand, the gospel makes clear that it's what needs to happen and that Jesus makes clear to Judas that this is your role. You must do this. Um, so Judas must do this thing that is bad. <laughs> so, uh, which is pretty much the view of the Gospels in the New yeah. Testament, um, especially the Gospel of John. In that Gospel, Jesus says, you know, go and do what you must, you know, and, and so forth. And none of them think what Judas does is a good thing, but it must happen for salvation to occur, right? Um, so, I'd say this Gospel um, is more sympathetic to Judas than what you find in the canonical gospels, the gospels of the New Testament, or any other early Christian literature for that matter. But I wouldn't say if he's a hero, he's a tragic hero. He's a hero that doesn't, yeah, you're not necessarily supposed to emulate. Like he's not a hero you should, you should be like, really. Um, but I must say, you know, it's, and hearing what you're planning to do potentially as a new show, one of the most fun things about modern Jesus literature, movies and novels and so forth, is indeed the way various authors try to fill in the character of Judas and think about what motivated him to do this and his relationship with Jesus and so forth. So Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 a very um, it's a great storytelling engine to to do that. And you're right, there's so many great works from Jesus Christ Superstar to Passion of the Christ to um, not Passion of the Christ. Uh, I was trying to think of the, the Scorsese movie, Last Temptation of Christ. Last Temptation That's, of Christ, yeah. The Judas yeah. figure is very important there. Another one, if you really are interested, a movie no one watches anymore is King of Kings with Jeffrey Hunter from 1960. Mm two, three, somewhere in there. Uh, the Judas character there is absolutely key. He's, he's the one who says, you know, we thought Jesus was going to bring a revolution, and then he didn't. So he hands over Jesus, hoping that will start a kind of Jewish revolt, actually. So it's all very political. So anyway, yes, uh, the Judas of, of the Gospel of Judas is way more interesting than the, the Judas in the New Testament Gospels, but still not quite a hero, I would, I would say. Right. Well, can you give us a, a summary of the of the plot and the events of the book? It doesn't have much of a plot. It's, it's, it's so it opens kind of with just a summary of Jesus's ministry that any Christian would recognize. You know that Jesus came and taught people to save them and did miracles and called disciples, and then it kind of stops. And uh, Jesus discovers his disciples sharing a meal, which they call their Eucharist, their Thanksgiving. And Jesus laughs at them doing this. And his laughter reveals to the, dis the gathered disciples two things. Uh, one, um, that the God that they worship in this Eucharist is not uh, the God who sent Jesus. They say, you know, he isn't our God that we're worshiping, your father, Jesus, no, you know, and Judas is the only one who knows where Jesus really comes from. So they learn this, and then they learn that there is another holy race, holy people, of whom they are not a part, <laughs> who get this and who know this. Um, this makes them very upset, and, uh, and Judas then is taken aside by Jesus and has a long conversation about why the world is the way it is um, and how human beings can be rescued from our current situation. Apparently our current situation is we are um, enslaved to rulers 
through their diabolical use of time and mortality to end our lives. And he learns that Jesus must, the, the human who bears Jesus must be killed as a kind of final sacrifice to the God of Israel, who is again, not Jesus's real father, but, you know, but one of these enslaving rulers. And then Jesus kind of goes up in a cloud. But then oddly enough, Jesus is back in the upper room, so to speak, celebrating what seems to be the Last Supper with his disciples. And Judas uh, agrees to hand Jesus over to Jewish leaders. And then it ends. Hmm. So not a lot happens, and it's all kind of wedged in to what we might consider the plot of the traditional Gospels. And it kind of begins looking like a very normal gospel. You know, everyone's like, oh yeah, Jesus came, blah, blah, blah. And it ends very familiarly with Judas handing over Jesus. Everyone's like, yes, well, this is what happens. But it's the in between these conversations between Jesus and the disciples and Jesus and Judas that is the exciting part for modern people, at least, uh, about the gospel. Yeah. So we have some some mentions of the of the Barbelo, of okay. some of these these rulers, uh, this. Uh, but but do you think that there is a, an elaborate mythology laying behind the book that that's not completely spelled out? Because you know they're maybe they're expecting you to be familiar with it or to have got an oral teaching or to have read another Gnostic tract. So I'm thinking something like the the elaborate mythology and description of the cosmos and how everything works that you would find it in a book like like Secret John. Did you think that right. there's that's a background. So here's the thing. Uh, the, the, when Jesus tells the Gnostic myth, right, there's an invisible spirit and there's, you know, this and so forth. It's very simple in the Gospel of Judas and not very elaborate. And you see characters that you see in more elaborate discussions of the Gnostic myth. Uh, and of course, the classic one you mentioned is the secret book, according to John, or the Apocryphon of John, right? Which apparently in some version was also known to Irenaeus around the year 180. So it's also a, an early Gnostic work. And it has a much more elaborate, you know, thing. These, these are, they're clearly on the same page about the basics, but they're, so there are two kind of um, prevailing interpretations of the simplicity of the Gnostic myth that we find in the Gospel of Judas. One is indeed that he knows a lot more, the author that is, knows a lot more of a Gnostic myth than what you see here. And either he does expect you to be familiar with something more elaborate, like the secret book according to John, or as some have suggested, uh, he's just not very bright and he, and he doesn't really understand it. So he gives a kind of, you know, Cliff's Notes version by, you know, in the way that a really poor undergraduate might give a Cliff's Notes version of my lecture and get like key things kind of wrong and, you know, and stuff. But okay, so that's one theory. The other theory is that this is just an earlier and simpler version that is, that, that is just different and not. Um, and not truncated and also not something that expects you to know more than is here, but is just potentially earlier. I, in general, go with the second view that it is simply simpler and earlier. I mean, one of the things that distinguishes it, for example, from a secret book according to John is it shows really no interaction with philosophy, mm. like Platonism. You know, I mean, none. I mean, it's really just kind of basic kind of coming out of kind of Jewish eschatological apocalyptic lore about rebellious angels and stuff like this. And it doesn't have, you know, the kind of lots of things happen mythically that are totally non-rationalized. You know, why does this happen? You know, the Apocryphon of John would explain it to you so that it makes sense. Well, it's like this, but this is, there's none of that here. So one possibility, of course, as I said, is that this guy is just kind of dumb. But I think the other possibility is that this is um, simply a different version. Um, in, whether the word earlier is right or not, it could just be parallel to, you know, roughly the same time with, by someone who has a less developed um, Gnostic myth than what we find in some of these other texts. And the re one reason I head that way uh, to that version is, of course, we can date it. I mean, we know it's before 180. And even the Apocryphon of John, which the myth of which Irenaeus seems to know, it's not absolutely certain Irenaeus knew that text, you see. So it could be later. So anyway, 
you can go either way in terms of kind of thinking about what this text is in terms of its in the history, if we want to call that the history of the Gnostic myth and its development. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating, fascinating. Um, what are some of its quote unquote problems uh, and issues <laughs> that, that the author or authors or community of this text uh, seem to have with, with other Christians, of other groups of, of Jesus communities? This is a very, what we call polemical text, right? It's, its main job is to condemn other people. <laughs> it's, you know, so it, it's, it's not a happy text. It's, uh, it, does, it does say there's a way to be saved, but it, it's very much, you know, I'm condemning other Christians. And uh, the, the key problem seems to be that these other Christians perform a ritual called the Eucharist that they think of as a like a sacrifice that is like or reminiscent of or based on the death of Jesus and that they celebrate this ritual in honor of the God of Israel, uh, the creator God of Genesis, and they consider them themselves doing this for the God of Jesus. And they do all this in Jesus's name and they rely on the authority of the original disciples for this. They're doing what, you know, Peter and James and John and all those people said we should do. All this our author does not like, right? He, he, he thinks sacrifice is a bad thing. Uh, the, you're the God you're worshiping is not the true God. He's a lower ruler who has revolted against the true God. Uh, to do this in Jesus's name is simply blasphemous because this is not what Jesus wanted or taught. And those other disciples that you now hold up as your authorities were clueless, actually, and didn't know what they were doing and didn't understand Jesus. So he's, he, it's, you know, it's pretty much an attack on some of the basic kind of worship and, well, the basic belief in God of other Christians. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think sometimes, particularly if people have a Christian background, but but even if not, you know, that they, they come to these texts and they read something like this and, oh, you know, wow, this is this is saying all these bad things about Peter. It doesn't seem to be a, a fan of Peter. But <laughs> but I think, too, that, that sometimes some of these texts, you know, they're picking up things in the canonical and emphasizing them, you know, really putting a, a lot of, of, of stress on, on some some themes that might be a, a a little bit more sub rosa, but but I think of the Gospels of Mark and John, especially of quote unquote their original endings. They they seem pretty critical of Peter. So uh, what what does this you know? Can you tell us more about what this this text has to say about about Peter and the other disciples? Yeah, I mean, um, people make a big deal about this part of it, and uh, well, the first thing to say that's interesting is that the Gospel never uses any of the names of the other disciples other than Judas. So you ne you do they're never named Peter James John whatever but you know um, there's a whole scene at the early part of the gospel where Judas is the only one who knows who Jesus is it's clearly modeled on a famous scene in Matthew Mark and Luke where Peter is the only disciple who can correctly name who Jesus is right uh, if you want the, the most famous version it's probably in Matthew chapter 16 because it's after that that Jesus says you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church right so um, yes, it's, it doesn't name these people, but it's clearly attacking those people, right, uh, in, in those guys in the, in the text. Um, the interesting thing to notice about it is that, um, is that, yes, people sometimes exaggerate how good the disciples are in the canonical Gospels. You're exactly right. Mark ends with, you know none of them looking good. I mean, yeah. you know, the only reason you know that they turn out okay is if you're a Christian reader who knows they turn out okay. You know, you just know that from, ha you know, from later lore of Christianity and so forth. You go, yeah, they look pretty bad here, but we know later on they did okay. Um, so, so this gospel, it's interesting. What people sometimes forget is that the last time we really see the disciples other than Judas in this text, they are repenting. And they're saying, you know, we have sinned. Can you please, you know, what can you, you know, can you help us, Jesus? Jesus turns them aside. I mean, it, you know, like 
go talk to your own gods, you know, or something <laughs> of that nature. He doesn't seem, and that's the last explicit mention of them. They seem to be implied to be present at the end where Jesus is, um, you know, in the upper room on his last night, right, you know, and so forth, but they're not mentioned. So the last vision we have of them in this text is them of being kind of repentant and being turned away by Jesus. And it, it's interesting to kind of think about whether it's possible this author too could imagine them turning out okay later. But the, the main thing is, yes, they come in for, for horrible criticism and in the end, the fact that he never even mentions their names, I think, is also kind of telling. You know, he's just not even giving the, Judas is the only one who's named. Yeah. And is this possibly a, a way to, to also criticize other Christians? Because, you know, by the second century, we probably have this idea that Christian communities can, can trace, many of them can trace their, their lineages back to specific apostles, to a spe a specific disciples. This became a very popular idea in Christian communities, right? So the Church of Rome goes all the way back to Peter. Uh, right. the, yeah, the church in Egypt goes all the way back to Mark. So is, is this sort of a way of, of maybe being the, uh, of criticizing other Christians? Exactly so. Right. Um, you know, these why why should you listen to us, Christians were saying in the second century. And one reason they would offer is because this disciple or apostle founded our community and taught its original leaders, and we are just doing what the apostles handed on to us. This is exactly Irenaeus's argument in the year 180. And uh yes, so uh, it's clearly um the 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 gospel has a kind of indirect way of doing this that is it's always the disciples you see doing these things celebrating the eucharist they have this horrible nightmare where they're making sacrifices in jesus's name and stuff like this but they're doing things that are anachronistic within the time period that they are they are clearly doing things that christians were doing in the second century not what they were doing during the ministry of jesus they were not you know, celebrating the Eucharist during the ministry of Jesus. So it's, it is a way completely of criticizing other Christians who claim uh, the authority of these disciples for what they do. And perhaps the not naming is part of that kind of, um, you know, polemical strategy. You know, I'm not even going to name these people. They're not important enough to even call by their name. But that's, that is exactly the case. And, you know, people then think, well, this group must be claiming Judas. And I don't really think so. What's interesting is the gospel does not claim to be written by Judas. Who wrote this is com left completely unexplained. So, um, you know, so we don't have a gospel according to Judas, right? As we have a gospel according to Matthew, according, you know, so that their authority is being invoked. Yeah. So I don't think they're claiming we're Judas Christians. Uh, but they are saying to these other Christians, you are wrong for following those original disciples. Yeah. Well, th there's sort of an idea, and, and I don't know that it's, it's that popular with, with contemporary scholars or modern scholars of, of ancient Gnostics really being into making parodies and reversals of, of uh, Judeo-Christian texts, Second Temple texts, texts that are circulating around them, however you want to, to put it, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but is this mostly a her heresiological idea that, that, that the Gnostics are specifically going through and finding the villains of the, <laughs> of the Bible and making them their heroes? Or is there some truth to it? Because I, I can see why, you know, if you know, if, if you know that theory, then you would obviously be like, oh, okay, well, Judas must be, they must be Judas Christians. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there, the, the, the issue of choosing negative biblical characters and making them models for you um, is actually attested in Gnostic texts in not just from their critics, right? So if you read some texts like say um, the Revelation of Adam or um, this book that can either be called the Egyptian gospel or the holy book of the great invisible spirit, um, both of which were at Nag Hammadi, they hold up the people of Sodom as good people. And see, the logic here is, is that if the God of the Old Testament is actually not the true God, but is indeed a rebellious ruler who actually is enslaving humans and preventing us from knowing the truth about 
divinity and our true selves, then clearly the humans that he persecuted must be the ones who had this clue, that they knew this stuff, right? So his enemies must be the good people. Now, you know, so the Sodomites, who apparently were, you know, destroyed with, you know, asphalt and brimstone falling from heaven, therefore must have been people who knew and were following the true God. Hence, the God of the Old Testament was being mean to them. Now, what's interesting in the text that we have, let's say a great character who might be then good for this role is Cain, the, um, you know, bad son of Adam and Eve, right? Um, whom God, you know, says, go away and, you know, so forth. And I turn my face from you and so forth and so on. Um, and in fact, Irenaeus precisely makes this claim that the Gnostics who published the Gospel of Judas um, saw Cain as a heroic figure hmm. as well. Um, however, no Gnostic text treats Cain in that way. Um, even though it kind of makes some sort of sense that they might, but none do. Maybe the text that does that will be discovered, you know, in a cave next week or something, but not, not right now. So anyway, the gist is, is that there's a kind of logic to that and um, that you know, the enemies of this God of the Old Testament must therefore be the ones who had figured out that he's not the real God and therefore are kind of heroic ancestors of us, the Gnostics, right? Um, but there's less of it in those texts than we'd think. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, this, you know, again, it's not the gospel according to Judas. It's kind of the gospel about Judas. But indeed, I do think there's a kind of... Um, in your face quality about choosing Judas as the only one who really knows uh, the truth about Jesus, right? So there is a kind of inversion going on. Um, but whether this is a, I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure it's a parody in the sense that in some ways it assumes you've read those texts and it may even think you should kind of read them again now that you know the real story. You know, it, it doesn't seem to be wanting to replace them so much as say, you know, this is what they really didn't tell you, you know. So anyway, all that is to say <laughs> that, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a logic to that kind of thing, but there's kind of less of it in the actual Gnostic text than we would expect, although it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, since we're discussing this, this this fake god, this evil ruler, I, I think maybe the most startling part of the book for, for anybody who might be familiar with the Gnostics and their mythology, and uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but does, does the text say that, that Judas is going to become the new ruler of the cosmos and, and this evil god that you've been mentioning, uh, this fake god who's sometimes called Yada Beoth or Saklos, uh, he's going to be given the boot and, and Judas gets his job. Is that right? Is that what this, this text says? That seems to be what the text says. So, um, you know, it's, you know, not only is it fragmentary and hard to read at places, it's also just characteristically very terse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's not, you know, something, it's, the author is not one to kind of explain at length, you know, uh, which is frustrating, but gives us jobs to do, I guess, those of us who read these texts. But uh, the gist seems to be that, yeah, what's going to happen, thanks to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, is that the current rulers of this world will be destroyed and will their, their heinous um, domination of this cosmos will come to an end. Um, but this cosmos will continue. You know, Christians... All, you know, all Christians of the ancient period, early period, believed that central to their message was the idea that this current world order will come to an end and it will be overthrown and a lot of the, you know, d divine or semi-divine beings who run this cosmos will be overthrown, the rulers of this world, Paul in the New Testament calls them, right? But what happens to this cosmos after that? Um, and Christians disagreed about that issue. And what seems to be the view of the Gospel of Judas is it will, this will somehow continue, but under new management, so to speak. <laughs> and, um, and that Judas will become um, the 13th demon, which, uh, you know, a structure of 12 ruling this cosmos is very typical in these texts. And he seems to be, I will now take the top position, so to speak, 
and be in charge. And Jesus says, you know, you will rule over these people are going to curse you, but you will rule over them. You know, so and people already are cursing Judas, obviously, when this is written. And um, so, yeah, it sounds like he will kind of um, be in charge. And so, you know, not a terrible fate for him, but it would be better. Probably he'd probably like it more if he could go to the other realm of blessedness and peace and so forth, rather than stay down here. It's kind of... Um, you know, like an empire telling someone who really doesn't want to stay in the, you know, conquered territories, well, sorry, you have to stay there and run everything. You don't get to go home. So this is his job is to do this, which is, I know, it's completely fascinating. <laughs> and uh, yes, and uh, I, 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 you know, it's, it, no one would have ever thought that this would be a likely scenario. Um but it seems to be the scenario. It's it's odd, I have yeah. to say. Yeah, I hate I hate putting that one so late into the show, but we need it, we need that other context first. But but I think it's <laughs> it's definitely something that's that probably excites a lot of people's imagination. And for my next question, I know that there's a lot of speculation uh, in this question, but you know the, the text is of course from well after the crucifixion, right? It's probably from sometime in the second century. So you know the world's been running along since the events in this book. Um, but, but why did you think the group behind it thought that there was a new cosmic order? Couldn't they look around and see that things are still pretty messed up? Well, you know, this is the problem of Christianity, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, uh, pretty much all the, um, to varying degrees, the canonical gospels also see Jesus's death as somehow initiating a complete change in the cosmic order right? Um, it's kind of just implied in Mark, you know, he kind of, but, you know, look in Matthew, people rise from the dead yeah. when Jesus dies. I mean, all the things that are supposed to happen at the end time start happening. There are earthquakes, right? And people, dead people rise and stuff like this. And so there's all this imagery of the cosmos as we know it is coming to an end associated with Jesus's death. And yet these scenarios are being written when the cosmos had not come to an end. And if you look around, things do not seem at all very different, right? Um, so yes, these Christians seem to think these things are still going to happen, you know, and um, it's going to, you know, <laughs> have some faith, John, that this, will, <laughs> that this is going to occur. And, uh, but yes, they all have this issue that um, somehow it hasn't happened yet. And um, yeah, so, you know, my own view is that they probably see, you know, we can't interview these folks, obviously, but it's likely that they sometimes will see events in their context as showing as in fact that they're right and that these end times are coming soon, right? That it's, you know, yes, it's not as soon as we thought, but they are, it is coming. Uh, I mean, this, we see this today, right? Yeah. Christians, some Christians will interpret bad things that happen in our world as harbingers of a coming end that Jesus will return and so forth. And um, much easier to do when it's only been a hundred years than when it's been this long. So yeah, it's an odd, it's an odd thing, but it's kind of a feature of Christianity as a religion that somehow it, when Jesus died, everything changed even right. though it doesn't look like everything has changed and everything still will change. So, yeah. So, you know, this is one of those places where we read this and go, oh, how crazy, you know, how, how could they possibly think this? But sit back, folks, and look at Christianity as a religion and all the things, you know, that, that is going on there. And in this respect, Judas is not so different from other Christians as we might think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked about, you talked about that the, they seem to be critical of, of the Eucharist, perhaps mm -hmm. the, as, as we would understand as, uh, as modern uh, theologians and modern Christians would understand too, of, of a real theological understanding of, of the Eucharist, perhaps as a sacrament. Mm -hmm. uh, 
do they seem not to like the other sacraments? Is there, is there hints or suggestions in the text about that as well? And do, do they not even like baptism? It just seems like a lot of these these Gnostic and Gnostic y first century groups seem to be really into baptism. So, uh, yeah. Uh, this, is a, this is one of the puzzles of the Gospel of Judas. I mean, I think we can be 100% certain they don't like the Eucharist. So, you know, no problem. That, that is clear, right? Uh, the baptism issue is more complicated. Because at one point, Judas asks, essentially, um, you know, and so those people who have been baptized in your name, and then there's a hole. So we're not quite sure um, precisely what Judas asks. And then we're not quite sure what Jesus says. But when it returns, when the hole is over, uh, Jesus, Jesus is talking about pretty horrible stuff, like, you know, people being killed and, and himself being killed. It's not a happy thing. Okay. Uh, most uh, scholars would say that most likely this author is not happy with baptism, at least as being performed by these other Christians, because anything that is done in Jesus's name in this text turns out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the fact that he calls it baptized in Jesus's name isn't, isn't good news really. And some have argued that, in fact, the whole anti-sacrificial polemic is also anti-baptismal because, of course, starting with Paul, um, Christians started to talk about baptism also as being united with the death of Jesus, right? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, okay. On the other hand, you're exactly right. Um, from other texts, we know Gnostics are, in fact, into baptism, but it seems perhaps not a baptism in Jesus's name right? They have a, a baptism where they talk about strange, mysterious things called five seals, um, most likely not the animal, but some sort of um, sealing in the sense of um, sealing an envelope or something like that, um, and have a bunch of other kind of divine beings associated with it, none of whom is named Jesus. Um, and uh, one of them that talks about this, one of the Gnostic texts that talk about this, is Revelation of Adam, or the Apocalypse of Adam from Nag Hammadi, which shares many features with the Gospel of Judas. And it actually criticizes people who have defiled the water of life. So that text seemed to suggest that, yes, we are into baptism, but these other Christians do a bad baptism. They have actually defiled the water of life. So um, so I think it's probably the most likely thing. And the other thing about Gospel of Judas, some real water imagery in a positive way in the midst of it. There is It's a very fragmentary section of the text where there is water that comes and doesn't water some places, but it does water God's garden. So, so there's water imagery that is clearly positive. Water brings salvation, but it doesn't bring it to everybody. And it only brings it to some people. So all of that suggests to me, again, you know, this is based on you kind of read the text and figure out its imagery and its rhetoric, and then you kind of compare it to other Gnostic texts, that it doesn't like the baptism in the name of Jesus that happens among the groups this author doesn't like. But I think there's a good chance there is a baptism the author does like, and it's just not in the name of Jesus. It, it is some other kind of baptism. It's kind of interesting because, of course, Jesus in this gospel, I know I'm just yammering on, is called no, no, Jesus no, no, no. all the time. I mean, it's like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And yet anything the gospel mentions that's done in the name of Jesus is bad. Right. So, you know, these other people are doing this stuff in Jesus's name and it, it's not good. Yeah. So um, Jesus is not happy with them. This, this is, this is uh, by the way, this is the Yammering On show. So please, um, <laughs> uh, please go for it. <laughs> Again, just, just speculation. Do you, do you think they... Do you think it's because they know a secret name for Jesus or the, they know who Jesus really is? Maybe they know that he's Seth, so they're going to be doing things in Seth's name. Is, is, I, I know that that's complete speculation, but do you think that's why they don't like people doing things in Jesus' name? Or do you have any theories on that? I have no theory, but, um, but I think we can speculate. Yes, why not? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, one of the other interesting things about the text is that the word... Um, potentially, the word anointed one, that is Christ, only shows up once, and it shows up um, uh, attached to a lower ruler, hmm. so a bad character. 
Now, the other possibility is it's not really Christ, that it's a mistake for something else, or it's also abbreviated. And so it could mean Christos, which means kind one or excellent one instead of Christ. So there's all these problems with this. But, but the main thing to say is that uh, most Gnostic texts actually do have positive characters that are called Christos, anointed one, immortal figures that are good. Uh, this text does not at all. So, um, so it, it's, it doesn't call Jesus the Christ. Jesus is the only name it uses, but yeah, it also doesn't like things being done in the name of Jesus. So yeah, I think there's a good chance that perhaps they have their own identific identifying term for him. Mm -hmm. um, could be Seth. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the other puzzling features of this is that the only occurrence of Seth is that there are in the higher realm of an immortal people, there are references to um, children or descendants of Seth being there, being present. Otherwise, there's no Seth. Uh, this, this text stops with the creation of Adam and Eve and, and their assignment to mortality uh, and does not narrate anything about the subsequent history of the human race, like the flood and all that, which you find in other Gnostic texts. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, I mean, that is so fun to think about, but you know, I don't know, maybe, um, yeah, maybe you're supposed to do it in the name of someone else, the Barbalo or something, I don't know. And uh, you know, Jesus, the one thing we're told about him that kind of fills out his divine profile is that Judas does says he, that he came from the eon of the Barbalo. Now, that doesn't say you are the Barbalo. It says you came from that eon. But, you know, maybe that's it. But that's the only time the name Barbalo occurs. Otherwise, it never occurs. But again, see, what's, what's difficult about this text and that scholars, you know, will disagree why one reason we disagree is that one way of interpreting this is to say if they don't say it they don't believe it you know mm -hmm. so some have said this text doesn't even believe anyone can be saved because there isn't a lot of good news in it you know they say it's not a gospel good news it's bad news you know, you know whatever um but this is a text about polemics it's really a text of condemnation and so a lot of stuff that I assume was part and parcel of what the author's more positive message would be, we should really call Jesus X or whatever, is just not here because the main task is to criticize other people and to condemn the rulers of this world that they mistakenly worship. Um, so yeah, it's, it's so negative that it's hard to know at times what he would be in favor of, but we can always, you know, we can speculate. Why not? Yeah. Maybe they, well, maybe they're way into the more into the Barbalo than we know. You know. Yeah. Um, don't the phraseologists call some of these groups like Barbaloites or or something like that? So just showing the emphasis that they might have had on this divine figure. Yes, this is a very um, sorting out these heresiologists is a is a real difficulty. But the gist is is that when Irenaeus talks about the Gnostics, he uh, kind of talks about it, like three or four different kind of subgroups. And one subgroup is very focused on the Barbalo. That's the kind of first one. And he did not use this term, but uh, later editors started to say, okay, these are different from the next one. So let's call these the Barbalo Gnostics. But then it gets picked up by others, you know, and, and later on we hear out there that there are Barbaloites out there and so forth. Um, are there? Do they call themselves this? What are they, you know, not quite sure, but I think it's a sure indication that, that they're into the Barbalo because other people see that as somehow distinctive about them. Um, yes. I mean, I think it's, you know, maybe, you know, uh, Irenaeus says these people who come up with gospel Judas are really into Cain, you know, the son of Adam and Eve. Maybe they are. I mean, he doesn't say anything about that, but you know, who knows? Maybe, you know, if we went to one of their meetings, they'd say, you know, oh, and Cain saw this before everyone else and, uh, you know, was framed for murder. And, you know, we just don't know. So, yeah. Yeah, I find that interesting when you when you said that, you know, if it's not in the text, we, we can't say that the author believed it because they didn't state it. But I, I don't, I know of, 
very little text <laughs> that lay out everything that the author believes, right? And if we held if we held other texts, including canonical Bible texts, to that standard, well, you know, it it, it, it would be it'd be very difficult to to read said texts. Yeah, imagine uh, if all we had from Paul was like, you know, First Thessalonians and Philemon. I mean, we wouldn't know that like the, you know, biggest deal of his life was the whole question of whether you need to be circumcised to be saved. I mean, these issues don't appear, right? Yeah. But that was the thing in his, that he, you know, Romans, Galatians, I mean, these are huge letters all devoted to this burning issue. Don't appear in those letters, you know? And so, yeah, and this, this is, I mean, this is what uh, studying antiquity makes it, you know, so difficult is that you don't know what we've lost and uh and you know look at the gospel of judas we didn't you know didn't have it until 2006 yeah. Yeah. uh okay i asking you to speculate uh, again which of course is sure. fun but it is you know i recognize <laughs> i recognize it as speculation sure but, oh, why is it that judas of the 12 is the only one who knows who jesus really is like is he chosen did he just figure it out did you think maybe he's an embodied higher being or someone who has had a spirit come upon him so therefore he knows that that jesus is also from the higher realms or or what's do you have any speculation on on why, why it's judas <laughs> Okay, well, I, for me, I, I can say why I think it makes sense that it's Judas. But um, behind your question is kind of the question of why Judas, that person, right? So here's why it makes sense that the author chose Judas, I think, is because the issue that he has with these other Christians is, was Jesus' death a sacrifice? To whom was it a sacrifice? And are we right to remember it with this, you know, commemorative meal called the Eucharist, where we drink bread, the bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus, and offer thanks to that God? And the answer to all these questions is no, you know, no, no, no. And so the person, the best person to know what the true meaning of Jesus's death was and why it had to happen would seem to be Judas. I mean, he's the one who did it, right? And He's the, he's the one that no one is claiming taught them this. Right? You know, no one is saying, oh, yes, Peter told us that this is why Jesus died and so forth. So it all in the text makes perfect sense that it would be Judas who knows because he knows what to do. Jesus like, is like, this is what you need to be doing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now within the text, then the question arises, like within the worldview of, the, of this guy, how why judas why what what why is it judas and not you know say thaddeus or bartholomew or something like that what makes him the one we are not told i mean it's just that judas is the one who knows um when they have this kind of jesus is like you know if any of you represent the true human being step forth and show you and none of them can do it except for judas who can come forward and say i know who you are you come from the barbello but you know, your true God, the one who sent you, I can't say that God's name, the ultimate God, the invisible spirit. Um, how, does Judas, how does Judas know this? Where does this come from? The gospel offers really no explanation for this, right? And indeed, it's what we might call its anthropology, its theory of the human, right? How do we have souls and bodies uh, is is obscure and perhaps not well thought out, right? Um, you know, like a philosopher might sit around and think, how do we have souls? How do we have spirits? Therefore, how do some people come to know Jesus and others don't? You know, they would puzzle all these things out. This gospel does not. So it's completely not clear how it is that Judas knows these things, knows this about Jesus while everyone else does not, and therefore why it's him. But I think in terms of its literary goals, its theological goals, the point it wants to make, Judas is the ideal person to choose for this role. Um, but I can't tell you why he knows. Now, okay, I'm gonna yammer a bit. Nobody. It is interesting at one point after Adam and Eve are consigned to mortality by the evil ruler Suckless. 
um, Jesus says, you know, well, you know, some people uh, get souls and spirits from this and blah, blah, blah. But then he says, God caused acquaintance or knowledge, gnosis. God caused gnosis to be with Adam and those with him. So the text does seem to believe that gnosis, the knowledge that uh, of divine truth, has been available to human beings. It's out there. You know, God made it available to Adam and those with him. And so it's, you know, the, the fact is, is that some people have clued in and others have not, but the gnosis is out there to be found. And so somehow Judas has it and the other disciples do not. And it doesn't explain why that's the case. Yeah. Well, Dr. Brocky, it's, it's been fascinating. And uh, I thank you for taking us through this, this, in some ways, very hard to read and understand <laughs> text. So um, now I understand that your new book, it's, it's a scholarly book. It's, it's expensive. It's not really meant for, for casual readers. But, yeah, but I, will tell, I will tell people, uh, uh, go, go to your library webpage and request that they order it in. I'm, I'm sure you'll get something out of it. And, and if people are interested in your, in your work, they want, to, they want to read your stuff, they want to know more, is, is, there, is there something perhaps uh, that, that you may want to direct them to that, that might be a little bit cheaper, a little bit uh, <laughs> less specialized? Uh, uh, well, less there, are, there, there are two things, right? I did write a book called The Gnostics, um, and it is indeed aimed at, at normal humans, not <laughs> uh, Coptic nerds. And, um, and it's not too long, and it's relatively inexpensive. So, um, so there's that. It's called The Gnostics. It came out in like 2010, I think, something like that. Um, I, you know, of course, as you can imagine, it's 12 years old. There are a few things in there I would rewrite if I had the opportunity, but nonetheless, there you go. Um, and also, I mean, if Gnosticism is really something that you just want to know more about and you want to read these texts and think about them, um, the Gnostic Scriptures is a is a good place to start, and we did come up with a second edition that came out last summer in 2021, and it, for what you get, 700 pages of Gnostic texts and introductions for 45 bucks, I think, is actually a pretty good deal, and that's from Yale Press, you, can, you know, and, um, and it will give you the Gospel of Judas and all these other Gnostic texts that I've mentioned, plus Valentinian texts. We haven't talked at all about them because they're not really... They, they would be horrified by the Gospel of Judas also. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the Gospel of Thomas, other kinds of things like that. And, um, you know, and it, it has bibliographies that send you to other things to read. And so, um, you know, so it's a great way also to get into this topic. And I always believe that, um, that a good translation of these texts is the, and reading them for yourselves is really the best way to get into this topic so you know i mean they're you know read them yeah they're strange and everything but you know find out for yourself that's what i say yeah and especially uh, and this is not a criticism of, of other translations because i know sometimes again these are very dense texts and sometimes it's best to to lay them out in a in a very scholarly manner, but I find that the translations in the Gnostic Scriptures book they, they sing a bit more. Uh, they're they're a little bit easier to read. They kind of capture the poetry a little bit more. That's that's uh, that that's my personal plug for that that excellent book. Yay! So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like it obviously, and uh, yeah, I mean different translations have different goals. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and the goal of that translation was to really translate. Yeah. And um, so some technical terms and so forth that other people would prefer to like leave in Greek or something. We don't, it's not in Greek, it's in English. And uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's the purpose of that text is to be as transparent to people who don't read Greek and Coptic and Latin and all that as possible. Yeah, excellent. And I'll, I'll quickly do my plugs, which is uh, joanite.org slash conclave. Uh, that's my Gnostic Churches. Uh, it's a mix of a conference, retreat, what have you. And it's being done online this year, close to the end of June. There, It's three days. I think it's 100 bucks, but there is a rate for students and, and for people who are having uh, financial challenges, with, which is 50. And it's, it's three action-packed days of, of lectures and talks. We do have uh, Dr. James McGrath, who's going to be talking to us Great. about the Mandeans and uh, um, uh, uh 
the uh, John the Baptizer. Uh, we're going to have uh, James Ishmael Ford, who's both a, a Zen priest and a Unitarian minister and is a uh, very interesting thinker on, on mysticism and religion. Uh, and I think uh, people will get a lot out of both those two lectures and the rest of them. So that's great. Yeah, that's one of my plugs. Uh, my other plug is Holy Grail, or sorry, mylandmeditation.substack.com. I have a bunch of these banners, and I'm reading the wrong ones, but this is the right <laughs> one. Uh, so this is, I, I, uh, I work as a writer, but I also work as a meditation instructor, and I teach mindfulness-based stress reduction. So this is how I keep in practice and give back a little bit. It's free meditation, 11 a.m. online, Sunday mornings, Montreal time. It's for everybody. It's not, you know, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to be anything. Uh, you don't have to be experienced. You don't have to be inexperienced. Finally, my final plug is uh, GCAST.ie. That's the Global Center for Advanced Study. It's a alternative debt-free university. It's where I'm presently doing my studies. I'm doing some research on Gnosticism there. I will eventually have my, my bio and some write-ups about the research that I'm doing on the GCAST website, so I'll start sending people there. But, you know, if you're interested in scholarly pursuits, liberal arts, philosophy, psychoanalysis, uh, theology, this is, this is a great place to check out and you can also do you know just one or two courses uh they, they have an excellent uh, radical theology uh program that that i highly recommend it's a very interesting stream of theology for the theological market out there okay thank you so much dr bracky that was uh so awesome and uh yeah thanks again and it's uh, been fun thank you so much for having me yeah okay well, then thanks again and bye everybody bye